extraordinary, famous, um, very, very clever people. Little Robert Wright was treasurer, he was Labour Secretary under Clinton, so has done a lot of work on policy over the last sort of 20 years. Uh, Richard Layard, who made his name as a national economist in the 60s and 70s, who was a member of the House of Lords, which is how he's often heard in Britain in academics. Um, you know, Richard Halliwell, known as the Harvard and so on. You've got all these very, very clever people doing lots and lots of work. And, and when you're when you when I was doing this work on the you know, Living Standards Framework, the question that, that I got to ask two kind of questions all the time. Right? One of those questions was um, from outside, and you'll hear this when you're referring to people in Parliament, but you know, from widely in matters. Um, what will be different? How will I know? That's a completely reasonable question, right? We're going to make a big deal about changing what we're thinking about. Um, then what is different is the, is the absolutely reasonable question to ask. And then, I don't know if it's obvious, but the, the, I got like the same question but from the other way around, from people inside the civil service. And people inside the civil service are saying, this is my day job we're talking about here. What is it about my day job that's going to change? Because if it's going to make a difference, then something I'm doing is not going to be the same. Something I'm doing is not going to be the same. How is my day job going to change? And when I looked at what was in the academic sphere, it was a little bit like our, our wonderful, sort of fantastic million dollar concept cars. Does anyone know what they do with the concept? You know, you have these great show, international shows. You know, the big companies spend huge amounts of money designing these cars, which will never see uh, an ordinary road. Point about doing this work, working with cars, is that eventually that becomes something a little bit more like that. Okay? Something a little bit more work a day. Something that actually uh, this kind of drive around in rather nice way around a kind of perfect um, sort of uh, test track. This is what actually gets people from A to B. Okay? I'm saying this slight, slightly facetiously, but not entirely, frankly. Right? There are 40,000 people. New Zealand working for the civil service. I, so I'm not including the people who work in universities, the people who work in hospitals, the people who work in schools, all those other services, certainly not people in local councils. I'm simply talking about the people who kind of make the civil service to understand it properly. Um, so when you're talking about something that's going to change people's day jobs, and that's what it means to say government runs on the basis of welfare, right? You are not talking about concept jobs, you're not talking about things that people spend years and years specialising in. You're talking about somebody who gets in at 9 o'clock and is going to be doing their job a bit differently between 9 and 5 and then going home. Right? It's something that actually gets you from A to B. So I should, should have said up front, rather than, because given there's only five people here, we'll just ask questions as we go along. It's much easier as a conversation. Yeah. Uh, and um, what's happening in this discussion, this wider discussion on people talking about policy, is they keep reinventing the concept cars. They keep saying that civil servants are not actually doing anything, so they keep trying to find different ways to, to do this really, really well. Uh, so you'll, um, you know, the kind of conferences I was going, people were, were um, uh, people would kind of demonstrate doing all this kind of very detailed work, of course, benefits analysis of mental health, and demonstrating conclusively that uh, really very persuasively that investing in mental health was a was an important thing for the wider economy. You could demonstrate that really very clearly. And people in the civil service were saying, okay, right, but my day job is thinking about the funding for training and for managing sort of New Zealand health service um, in memory. I think there's a facility somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people working in New Zealand health service in various different capacities. The day job of the civil servants is thinking about if you're going to change how you're operating, what is it you're going to do to retrain that number of people to shift so that the way the service operates is, operates differently? It won't be everything that can be done. You don't want people to stop. You know, someone has a heart attack. You don't want the people, the cardiac surgeons, to stop treating heart attacks. But there's something else that you want to happen more widely in the system. What does that look like? Right, those are kind of really good, and they are more. You know, New Zealand Health Service costs around about $14 billion in public health costs. Um, that's an awful lot of money that you've got to think about. And by the money, I'm thinking, you know, these
these are people, most of that goes into wages of various sorts, so very skilled people, so are those kind of things. In other words, we're thinking about what is it we need to do in the detail, right? given that we've got the grand piece of work that's telling us that mental health is going to be this big issue that's going to be, we're going to need to challenge. Right? Uh, so that you, um, and unfortunately that's something that, that's happening in New Zealand as well. So that's my kind of, the, one of the things I want to say to you, that most of what I, the, the work that we do is that work about trying to think about how to make this work a day. And because it's work a day, right, it looks kind of a bit sort of, well, work a day, right? Okay, it doesn't have that sort of element of excitement in it that you can get from some of the discussion. But when you do that, you're changing people's day jobs and hopefully in the process actually means that what is delivered Does that make sense? Of a, if you come away with nothing else from this conversation, okay, that's the thing I want you to come away with. Okay? And I've kind of, what I'm really going to do is sort of talk a little bit more detail about what I mean by that um, uh, in the rest of this. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that given that mostly we're at the concept card level, I didn't, in, you know, like when Ford or someone does a concept card, It'll be like five to ten years before they actually put something in production, right? Um, that's the kind of position we're in, right? So Treasury at the moment has sort of this ambition of trying to do this work over about ten years. And I think that's really, really ambitious. Okay, this is something. It's a process that takes a bit of time, right? In terms of the change. Okay, so to say this slightly more philosophically, oh, sorry. Um, another way to say this, so the, the next two slides really are my attempt to, to sort of move away from a total excess or to a more serious excess. So the, Grant Robertson, um, when he talks about living standards, and this is a quote from when he was at Davos in January, and he was talking there. Um, it's about the idea of looking at the real data and the concrete and the evidence, things that are actually going to, we're, we're going to know they're going to change in people's lives. That evidence is about investment thinking about long-term intergenerational effects, okay? okay? But it's that sort of the real and the concrete, okay? Not the conceptual, that's the big, uh, the big change that's gonna be there. Uh, um, and this, this is a really important part of thinking about this. I, I know I keep going on about this number of people working in the civil service, but it'd be very, very easy to change the language, it's very, very difficult to change what people do. And that's a really important part of so another way, um, and you'll see me kind of offering various different diagrams of hierarchies and things. And, uh, what what is all this has all been for me is about that journey where I've been trying to understand and interpret in, in terms of things that people can do, why I'm saying things that are different. Right? Uh, and one of the, the ways, so this is really, in, in a sense, this is that car diagram, I've just done it a little bit more philosophically. Um, what you'll um, what you'll find is a very great, uh, sorry, New Zealand, where this really bites is around thinking about the Maori worldview as opposed to um, other worldviews within New Zealand and about the differences between them. Uh, and what we'll try to do at Treasury for a couple of reasons is that we've done some work around thinking about what that would look like. Um, is to step back a bit and say, in terms of people's day jobs, what changes when you have those different worldviews? Right. Um, and so part of this is purely that Treasury is a civil service entity. Right? Our job is to work for, um, for, for whichever government is elected to deliver, um, uh, deliver a series of things that we hope and the government works better. Right? It is not for a Treasury to turn around and tell people what the world Respond to the world view and authority. In practice, um, you know, I mean, stepping back from the heat and light of politics, right, uh, there is actually not a lot, you know, there's a lot of similarities. Right? So you think of a budget, right? Um, typically, a budget is around uh, the, the sort of total amount of spend that's, that's new in a budget is about somewhere between one and three billion dollars. So just after the GFC, it was closer to one billion. As we move in a little bit more space room, it's going to be two billion. Right? That's typically where the sort of budget, the amount of money you're talking about in a budget. 
total government spend in a year is around about $80 billion. Okay. So when you focus on the budget, and you do have to focus, come in, Jim, when you do have to focus on the budget, that, that's the margin, in the natural language sense of the margin. The $80 billion is where it's going to be very similar. If the world view is changing what's going on in the one to three billion dollars, right, quite a lot of what's there is going to be the same across the government. So uh, people have the, one of the most political areas, I think it's fair to say, will be the welfare system. Okay? Um, typically in a budget, the, the, the budget for the welfare system from uh, 2018 was a slidgy number, 25 billion dollars. Okay? Um, if there is a colossal investment mm. in the welfare system, uh, this time around, the difference might be of the order of 500 million to a billion dollars. Right? The base amount, right, 95 plus percent of it, is going to remain unchanged. Okay? And the reason I'm saying that is because most of what we're trying to do with this work is to think about that base of spend. Right? Yes, you change what's at the margins, that's really important. But what you also do is think about the, the rest. Uh, or to think of it in terms of from your, uh, for the people that we're trying to um, sort of support in government, it's what matters is things like health. Right? What matters is how well the welfare system works, what happens is how the education system works, what happens is how the justice system works, what matters is how well the various regulatory and legal functions that government does. That's actually what matters most of the time. Right? Um, and what we try to do in thinking, breaking this down is to think about is the worldview element, which is important to the margins, and there's a lot about the language that people are using. But what really matters for government organisation, what matters because this is what matters to most people, is the level below that. It's not the language with which we talk about, say, poverty. It's whether or not, in fact, we make people's lives better. Right? That's the bit that matters. Uh, and that's what I call the elements. So, um, and I'll come in a little bit more detail about that later on. So the, 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 the concept car science side of it is much less important than thinking about what it is that actually makes a difference. Um, for, in terms of the practical side of this, um, for a treasury, well, the other thing we've got to think about is what are the best ways of proxying the kind of things that we're interested in, what are the best indicators we've got, okay? Um, and it's, uh, this is the other thing, particularly for those who have come from Economics background, but I want you to take across. There is a big difference between the indicators and the data that you're using. Right? If you don't believe me, go out there and examine the difference between the labour force survey and the household economics survey and the census, and the differences between their estimates for unemployment. Okay? And they are substantive and important. Right? Um, and, and, and how you're in, in the what it is that you're using those measures to proxy for, those elements there. And my suggestion to you is that for most people, most of the time, that is much more important than the elements of the world view. Okay. So as someone who came from a philosophy background, I'm part of a degree of philosophy, what I'm really saying is that we need to be really careful to put the philosophy in its place and think much more about the, the sort of kind of key elements of what we're trying to do. We're all very quiet. I even thought, you know, Challenge at least some of your kind of things that you're doing. What are your thoughts on that, Scott? On the example you gave about yeah. the unemployment issue, yeah. is it because they define unemployment differently? No. The difference? It's, a diff it's because they, so there's a, there's a standard definition which is set by a group called the International Labour Organization for Unemployment. Yeah? Um, so, one of my sort of different contexts, so I'll suggest to you, I can give you some examples of people. So imagine a 19-year-old who's, who's who prefers to surf rather than look for work, or a person who's just come through personal injury, right? Or somebody who um, suddenly has been out of the labor fault market for a while and is thinking about work, so they're sort of briefly glance at the newspaper. And I'll ask them, you know, how, how many of those people, when we say 4.5% of people, Actually, it's now 4%. So 4% of people in New Zealand are unemployed. So our unemployment rate is around about 4%. How many of those three people count as unemployed in that 4.5%? Anyone have the answer? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This is what, <laughs> okay, this is your definition point, right? Okay, the answer to the question is none of them count as unemployed. Okay, all right? Don't worry, people whose day job is being lecturers in economics get that question wrong, okay? All right? It's because the definition of unemployment is very particular around what counts as the workforce and what doesn't as to who gets included or not. So the answer to your question is it depends. So the, defin the standard definition remains the same, but what information you actually pull out and put in to actually derive your number does actually depend a lot on what survey you're using and whether you have the right information. Yeah? And even sim th simple things like what, how you ask the question. Yeah. So, yeah. A year ago they changed it so uh, and it's shocking that it was only a year ago, but they changed it so looking on the internet counted as looking for work. I think towards the beginning of 2018, it didn't count as looking for work. Right? It's a big international organization, things work very slow. It took them that long to work out the internet was important. Yeah. <laughs> that would make a huge difference to the right? number of people. <laughs> so, but the thing I want you to go through, so when I'm going to kind of show you this effect, right? Thinking really with a conceptual element of this, that most of the work on a team that I was running, I would say three quarters of our work was thinking actually about could we have the data that we wanted and what we need to do with it in order to have the right kind of impact. Okay? So you'll hear lots about consultation, and consultation is important. You have lots of quite philosophical discussions about well being. The body of the work is at this end of it. Okay? And I, I'm a, I employed interns, one of whom came from uh, Auckland University, yes, uh, and her day job was going through literally thousands of lines and rows of data to check whether or not we could write stuff in there. Right? Because obviously we can't put stuff in the, on our website, which is long. Right? So we brought her in to, to, help, to help us do that. Yeah, this is a boring as hell job, isn't it? Somebody had to do it. Right? Um, yeah. So, so, this one's, so for part of that, in terms of turning this into a day job, this is as important as that conceptual side. It's not a conceptual side, it's important for that side of the audience. Did I answer your question already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I asked everybody here before they start, just what's your background? Are you in policy, are you in economics? Uh, so I, I study at Conduit, I'm in my second year doing commerce and science. Commerce and science, so which side? I study physics. I major in stats in my science side, economics and information systems from my commerce. So quite a mixture here of policy and stats and right. Um, right, so I've been sort of telling you the value of being concrete about things, so let me start off by trying to be concrete about things. Um, and one of the, uh, so the, uh, I've got two diagrams, uh, two, two comparisons here. Just uh, this because mostly I tend to give these sessions to civil servants who tend to be in their 40s and 50s. So they tend to be in the in one of these two groups. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, part of what I've uh, been trying to get across is uh, with this diagram is that we'll have lots and lots of detail, vast vast amounts of detail. But what's really important with the well-being work is just to step back again. And to think about these kind of over, literally the over the overarching picture of where we go. So if you look at just one of these diagrams, right, and on my last slide, do you put the slideshow by the way on your web page? So you can put yeah, it'll be on YouTube. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So my la the last slide has got all the links to various different things. I'm very would be delighted if you follow up this work to sort of have a look at it. Okay. Um, and the different elements of, of current well-being, right, or at least the ones where we have enough data for it, all being linked together. Right, so the the easiest way to think is to think of this as the kind of the sort of basic bit. Right, we've got a blue line, a black line, and an orange line. Right, the wider out the blue line is, what it means is the particular population is much more likely to have high levels of well-being. Okay. Uh, the wider out the orange line, the more likely they to have low levels of well-being. Okay. The shape is based upon those particular dimensions of it. So for instance, couples without children are much more likely to have uh, relatively high income on consumption, that's income on consumption per person, right? Relative to couples with children, okay? The reason why this diagram works with 
it's like older people who tend to have children, is they look at the two, and obviously very clearly couples without children are much more likely to have high well-being than couples with children. Okay? Right? Um, but what's, to me, interesting about it is not just that, so there's that high level of thing, and um, though I, it's kind of funny, it's kind of not as well, because if you're saying couples without children have a relatively high income for couples with children, turning that round, and you're saying um, children are much more likely to be in situations of higher levels of low well, sorry, low well-being yeah, than adults, adult, all adult households. Okay? So it's kind of funny and kind of not. Right? Okay? The same thing that I can get, so this is now going into some of the, the sort of details of this. And uh, when I looked at this, this was really surprising to me, is that the family, couples with children, if you look at the top right, the top uh, left here, this is much more of a, like subjective well-being is just a question, how are you doing today, basically. And for social connections is how well are you connected with your neighbours, right? And I was surprised when I first saw this. This, this is data from New Zealand from 2016, okay? Right, so this isn't, as much as we can do now, this is now. Um, what you're finding is that couples with children are finding it much harder to interact with people around them. And if you think about you know, the discourse that we have around sort of, uh, particularly youth, being disengaged and being unable to connect and there are implications for suicide and that sort of thing. Uh, sorry, I should say, this is a very good predictor of suicide, social connections. Basically, people are really, really lonely in more ways so they commit suicide. Okay. Right? Um, so uh, there's something. So uh, though uh, couples with children, I think that couples with children are less likely to be suicidal. But there is something going on here around what is happening when people have children right, that is actually sort of isolating. Okay. Right. So you can see the big picture here, and it's also get right into the details of this in terms of thinking about those different elements of what well-being is. And that's, and you, I hope it's clear how this can start to inform thinking about policy. Right? We've started to get into the details of it. And we've started to distinguish between, the, it's, if you look at the orange lines, so they are different. They're not that much different. Right? It's the blue lines that are different. Another way to say this is when you compare the impact of children on families, um, it's much more likely, you are much less likely to have high levels but it's not that you're more likely to have low okay. right. You start to think about those different elements of uh, the balance. Okay, so um, if I'm honest, I started using this one because it was one where it, it, there's not a kind of obvious politics to this, so you can kind of talk quite rapidly. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, when you say it's rest of the population, Yep. For couple without children, does it mean that it's couple with children? It does, yeah. but you also have other groups uh, of people. Yeah? So okay. for instance, you have single people. You have people in households where it's not clear whether they are single or not. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> families, yes? Right? Um, and that's quite a lot of people, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so it's not just, they're not just, so obviously male and female. Uh. For 99% of the population, it's, it's, uh, it's one or the other. Uh, so yes, that's certainly one, one, one possibility, and if that's the case, I'd feel a bit more comfortable about that. So what we're saying is people are making, and it's, um, pe the people who really care about income are getting what they want, right? People who have a wider range of things that are important to them are not. Are, are, are not. So if that's the explanation, that would be fine. Um, as it happens, I don't think that works, right? But that would be great, yeah. I mean, for some people, there is a bit of truth in that. More, more widely. Uh, what this, uh, um, if any of you know, know much about the way people measure poverty, is what they do is they call it equivalization. So basically, you know, the same amount of money will go, will not do as well for a family where there's five children as opposed to a family where there's one. Okay? What you find is driving this down 
if in fact it's larger, so that the kind of equivalent people, or the children, are actually having to spread the same kind of way. Yeah. So it, it's, I mean, because we don't actually ask people, is it clear that it's your aspiration? That's making a difference. You can't tell quite, but it, the suspicion is that it's probably something else going on there as well. At least for some people. Um, this was, so this was the one, a um, little bit more, a uh, little, little bit more political, right? But also a little bit more, so a little bit kind of interesting and challenging, okay? Uh, so, I mean, the, the, so the blue and the orange lines mean the same as they did before. Note, obviously, that they are other ethnicities in the Pacific and Asia, right? So that the rest of the population are also included. Uh, with European descent, um, because of the way the, data, the stats collects this data, you can put how many ethnicities you identify with. Yeah? So this will include all people who have, a, have some identified with Pacific ethnicity, um, but a chunk of those people will be people who have identified with both Maori and Pacific, for instance. Yeah? Yeah. Um, now you can see, um, the other reason for showing this is you can see how different these shapes can and the really striking thing here is obviously around Pacific, Pacifica is the way that uh, much more likely to have low beard. Uh, it's worth looking at those women now. Uh, though, and this is probably a migrant factor, right? So most Pacific families came uh, in the sort of the 60s, so that a fair chunk of the people population here are, are people who came from the Pacific to New Zealand. You'll find that first generation migrants, like me, right, really like New Zealand. So they will report high levels of uh, subjective well-being. That's why we came to New Zealand, right? The same will be true of first generation Pacific migrants. The children of those migrants on their hand are not so happy. And so you're seeing, so it, though it's relatively high given the, the level of, of low material uh, well-being, um, that's actually, you'd have to disaggregate that and find there's also quite a lot of generation impact going on there. But, you know, but this kind of tells quite a strong story, it seems to me, about what are the drivers for the well being. Uh, what's really interesting in Asian ethnicity, and I'm sorry to say Asian ethnicity basically lumps everybody who came from uh, Kazakhstan through to Japan, right? So quite a wide range of different cultures, right, together. But what is interesting uh, here is this one. And the question behind there is asking people how, um, how comfortable they feel being in New Zealand given their differences. Uh, and there's a clear, clear message on this. Right? It's a clear, really deeply depressing message, particularly as um, disproportionately, people from Asian ethnicities have very, very high levels of knowledge and skill. So it's not about, so if you look at, for instance, the contrast between that and that, that is also telling the story. Okay. Right. So, the, uh, different story from this, different depressing story. Right? Okay. Um, he has been the have some views on this. <laughs> Sorry, he has been the numbers, like minus 50, minus 25. Uh, like so this is one of those things where you've abstracted the numbers quite a lot. So these are actually norms with various uh, sort of differences. Right. Don't, the, the uh, uh, sorry. So in one sense that makes it worse. The, so this, this isn't a like a linear scale. This actually goes further and higher. So further it out, further it out here, it's much more mm. it is. Right? So this is really stark. Uh, but don't don't think just because this is you know this is minus twenty five that's not that's double that doesn't work. No no yeah. it's the norm. Yeah. yeah. Because um, like let's say for um the low um well being indicator. Yeah. If it's gonna be really low, shouldn't it it would be tending towards the negative value? Is that right? So this is so this is so the different um what the scale here does is say, 
the likelihood of being um, of that lower. So how likely are you to have high well-being, or how likely are you to have low well-being? So that's oh. further, yeah. And they're not, because there's also a middle group where you're just roughly in the middle. Yeah. And that's actually quite a lot of people, yeah? uh, potentially. But this one is quite bifurcated, as you can see. Uh, but potentially, that's quite a lot of people. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I hope I'm convincing you, you can tell quite a lot of a story here, right? And a lot that's very policy relevant. And what's really important is the fact that if you just focus on the income side, you're going to be missing some huge and important things that are very, very important when you're thinking about the effectiveness of policy and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, so, that, so this is kind of a proxy for well-being, right? but for lots of important things, it's not a very good proxy. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we have a dashboard, and it's, um, one of the links that's at the last slide fits you through to the dashboard. You can do this kind of analysis to your heart's content. There are vast amounts of data and all kinds of different effects. Okay? I would love to see people doing that. I'd love to see people, not just you, what I'm doing here is just descriptive statistics. Okay? What I'd love to see is people actually doing proper analysis of these numbers and actually really getting at like your question there. Can we notice something different about couples with and without children that might help explain some of those differences? It's not just that um, we have more people in the family and then splitting the income here. Are the other things going on? It's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> it's really relevant, yeah, pretty close to the relevant question. So try and see some of that, uh, that kind of work going on. There's, uh, there's a real, uh, yeah, there's a real dirt. Okay, so I've given you a kind of taster of, of how the data is. I'll just go a little bit more conceptual just quickly. So what we've done is we've, um, so some of you, uh, those of you who've done economics know what I mean by the national, uh, sort of system of national accounts. No? Yes. You can nod, it's okay, you're among friends. <laughs> okay, um, Guy and Cork, well actually Keynes, so it starts off with Keynes. You, you must have done this when you did your first macroeconomics one, Y equals, you know, what the, what the, Commercial is commercially is spent. What um, government spends? What individuals spend? Plus the difference between imports and exports. Remember that bit? <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. A guy called Kuznets. Um, a bit later on, who was in some sense friends of, of Keynes, um, got into looking at this in a little bit more detail and asking some really hard questions like, um, what counts as what, at what point is spend income and at what point is it sort of investment by a firm and that sort of thing and uh, and then through a man called Robert Stone, who from my view is, he does, they don't talk a lot about him, but he was the guy that went to the United Nations and really got the United Nations to use this stuff. I think it's got like 200, his original thing was like 200 page annex to a document where he just went through all the detail what that would look like. And the current variant of this is on the United Nations website, it's 700 pages, that's the core document. You then have several dozen other documents that go into lots of detail. This vastly complicated system. So when you see GDP growth is 1.5%, behind that lies colossal amounts of work going to be thinking about what these kinds of things are. Um, we are nowhere near that, right? Nowhere near that kind of detail. Um, but what we've been, the OECD has been trying to do is trying to start us on that path, trying to think more about that. And the, the, stepping, the, the starting point for that is at least let's be clear about whether we're talking about how things are now and how things are in the future. In the future. So the language you hear around this is the word sustainability, okay? but it's not just environmental sustainability we're talking about. It's social sustainability, economic sustainability, maybe the sustainability of sort of skills and training and, and uh, that sort of thing. Okay? And then part which I would love us to have done more work, but we just didn't have the time to do around resilience. Not just the core, not just the central projection. It's how how robust do we think that is likely to be? Absolutely crucial, right? We do that, but we do it in a, a you know there's a document produced every year, but it's uh, not very good. And it's not that's not unique to New Zealand. That's international. Right? It's really at a significant high level. And because of that, we 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 weren't able to do that. But 
Um, at least let's start to think about that. And if you think about the question, how much of the questions we are bringing policy around, is what we're doing now damaging for the future? Is the development of, say, a roading system something which gives us current income but has an environmental or social or indeed economic consequences down the line if we don't mess it? Core, core question. Um, and the starting point for this, and this, this is, I mean, I mentioned the, the kind of the, the different worldviews around Mari and Mari, yeah, and this is the area I think where that's going to come back in and kind of have that core and quick part of the discussion about how much we want this. All we wanted to do with the capital, partly this maps to what the OECD does. So we just, there's kind of lots of fancy language. The word capital here is a metaphor. It's not really, it's not the substance that you think you really want this to be. But what the metaphor is saying is if you think about what matters for the future, a way to do this, a bit like the national accounts where the, um, you know, the, 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 the Keynes' original equation is an identity, right? You put the definition onto the identity. So think of this as an identity, a way of trying to uh, separate out these different elements. So when you think about the future, obviously you want to think about this wider environment, right? And, and that aspect to it. But that's most of that, in fact, what's important about that is that it's the, it is the natural world on which humans have an impact. It's not human beings. Then there's this, you know, human beings as individuals and what they have as individuals, but there's also human beings as a society. And the thing is, you can measure these things. It's not that you can't measure them, right? You can measure them, and they are different. Uh, there's a famous case study, it's a hard end to the comment, it's a famous case study of a German company, uh, yeah, a German company, literally, um, uh, uh, got one of its factories and um, took it apart and transferred it to Albania. I don't remember why they did this, but they did this, right? And so all the physical machinery was there and they made sure all the people working in the factory had the same kinds of qualifications, but the factory in Albania was nothing like as efficient as the factory had been in Germany, okay? Right, so this, you, can, you, know, you can measure this in dollars and cents. I think it's really known, marks and pay. Um, what social capital actually means, and clearly it means other things as well. It means can you trust people or, um, not to rip you off? Right? Uh, you know, the, uh, the relation, wider relationships with each other. Okay? So you've got that kind of thing, and then the final part of this is around the sort of material aspects of the world. So it's different from the environment, in that the environment is about the natural, the sort of natural world and our, our impact on it and its impact on us. And then there's a bit that we kind of make. And that's the kind of financial and physical capital. Right? So that's an identity. Right? If you want to try, I can bet, so let's put me a challenge. Think of something which is going to be really hard to fit in a system like that. Brightest of New Zealand that's gone. So what's the question? <laughs> so I've got, think of, I mean, so let me kick, kick off then. Think about a church. Where does a church go? It's a, it's a physical asset. But it's an yeah. institution. Yeah, so it's kind of, kind of uh, I mean, churches quite often are used to, to help develop actually income. The starting, the, the universal schooling system in Western world started with church schools, right? That's why to this day churches still run schools, right? Okay, um, and it's, so it's got all kinds of things. So if you're going to have to do, you know, you've got this identity, you're going to have to make some calls about where you put stuff, right? And they're going to be wrong. <laughs> This is the thing, right? Or they're going to be wrong in ways, but they're also going to be right. Well, nice. Go on, so can you think of other things? We've got challenges a lot on this. So, stuff where you think this, isn't, this doesn't sound right, like intuitively. It's quite nice accountants have to do this stuff all the time. They try really, really hard. And they do some amazing work, some amazing conceptual work. Yeah. Go on. I don't know if this is sort of the right idea, but because, so is the point that they all have to equal something? Yeah. So if we want that thing to equal more, then we have to improve one of 
Jazz, they did like construct lots of like buildings and stuff, and that would improve physical capital quite a lot, but it might damage natural capital more than that. So as a whole, the overall well-being actually goes down if the cost is more than the benefit. So this is so part of the question here is is does the thing, is the well-being now going to get worse or going to get worse in the future? And then how do you contain all those different elements? So we build a road. Uh, when I was in the UK, we had this place in Leeds where they basically built a road right through the middle of this, this sort of suburb and destroyed the suburb by doing that. But you could imagine the um, uh, all those kinds of different impacts. So to answer your question, so on one hand, there's a benefit of having a road, on the other hand, there's the losses associated with loss of community, which is the same cost. Where would you put those? They're, they're, I mean, they're real economic costs. Shops, the shops, basically what happens is shops in the area where the rain just got shut down. So there's a real economic impact of the building this road. Right? Okay. But that but that's, feels to me that that didn't quite capture everything that you're trying to say when you just put a shop shut down. There's an economic impact there as well. And where you put those impacts would be up for grabs in terms of doing these kind of studies. So, for instance, in the current national accounts, if somebody um, so, so one of the things we've observed is this gradual shift towards a, a sort of prof professional people looking after children. So at schools, but now you have early childhood education. Right? Um, so um, what that means, that uh, so part of the, the the argument for that is around um, some people have proved it didn't work. Uh, weren't in the labour market, but now in the labour market. So that would increase national income. But just the fact that a task that was done voluntarily by a parent is now paid for increases national income. It's the same task. In fact, it's even uh, for those who don't have children, there are organizations like PORS, which is essentially a home base where parents look after other children. Right? So the activity of that parent who previously looked after their own children, they now look after somebody else's child, now gets included in the national account. Right? So this is kind of perversity of the way the national accounts work. But some of those still happen. Sorry. So a drawback to sort of using national accounts to measure is if someone goes out and smashes the window yep. on purpose, then it would actually increase GDP to get that window fixed and replaced, but it's not actually productive in that it's sense. So it doesn't capture what yeah. is actually happening. That's the restore of all if you have the Second World War. Right? Second World War is wonderful for GDP growth. Destroyed large chunks of Europe and Asia, right? Thereby, you had to then rebuild it. Fantastic period of economic growth. And you'll see, look at the graphs. You'll see GDP just shoots up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Right? And okay, so that's your, your kind of the big example of what your, your crime was after, yeah? yeah? And so th there's something kind of missing there. But there's, we're also going to miss some things in here. We're going to say some really strange things. But the idea is to capture that little bit in the bottom, to move away. So, Hope in the Second World War example, we would you know, have to say a little bit more about what we've lost. Okay, but that's that's the sustainability element. Uh, so the problem with these things is they're always complicated, but that's kind of because if you were to ask a person, right, what you know about their life, uh, what is it that made them sort of happy? What is it made them sad? Very few people will pick one thing that makes them happy or sad and prove that with everything. Most people will talk about something complicated around their health, you know, kind of income they have, and their friends, and their ability to do particular things, uh, and, uh, and so on, right? One of the, one of the uh, secrets of this stuff is that in current well-being, the environment doesn't actually become very important. It's not actually that important. It's important for the sustainability, but it's not that important for the company. Cultural identity, to me, as a, someone who came through conventional economics, was actually a really This is, bear in mind, this is the ability to be yourself, right? Um, uh, health, uh, sorry, older people, health is really important. Right? Um, so most people, so for, for older people, job and earnings is less. They, one of the questions, so the, the 12 here were uh, basically what they had in the OECD, um, but we have done more work cultural identity side, because that's an issue in the room. It's a big issue for the opportunity to have to work on. Uh, so 
And one of the questions, one of the challenges we get is that if you think, you know, you think about diversity throughout the world, isn't these things going to be really different? Okay. So two things. First of all, the, the diversity within populations is far greater than the diversity between populations. Okay. The difference between somebody 18 years old growing up in Indicardio to someone who's 65 who spent their entire land, their entire life in actually Turkey. Right? Very, very different. That kind of diversity is at least as important as the difference between countries. Um, and what is different is not that they don't have these elements, it's that they're given different rights. And that's where the actual the, the real work lies. My um, personal view, right, and you'll also hear this from, do people know who Marilyn Murray is? Yes? Nice. <laughs> I think that there's a certain generation of New Zealanders for whom Marilyn Waring, yes, and then there's a little bit of a younger generation who she's not so famous. <laughs> right? I wasn't in New Zealand at the time, but I've met her since, and I know why she's very, very famous. So, do people know who Marilyn is? Yeah? She's actually a lecturer at uh, the Messi. AUT. Is it Messi? AUT, but on the North Shore. Oh. Uh, yeah. But um, so she's famous in New Zealand for a couple of things. She's famous in New Zealand for being the person that brought Maldu down in 1994. Is that right? Mm. Oh, 94, yeah. Um, but she's also written a lot about how the statistics that economists tend to use miss um, a lot of the time, the non-paid time. What do you think is the biggest single source of non-paid work? Household jobs. Household jobs, yeah. Okay. So Marilyn, you might accept that's one of the big losses there. What has always puzzled me is there is a cluster of economic literature um, from a guy called Gary Becker, who you probably did a study, I don't know, you studied that, right? From the 1960s around time use. It was actually a guy called Lancaster, which was Becker developed it as a thinking about unpaid work, right? So if you like your, you know, like your economics to be full of equations and to calculus and all this kind of stuff, we can do it. We have the data there. Does government, when it thinks about well-being, usually makes any of that fantastic formal work? I mean, there's this point that Marilyn Waring makes, is that there seems to be a bias, and there's an important gender bias here, around understanding the different things that uh, different groups of people are doing. Uh, so, um, uh, so th these kinds of elements, the international, right? So the, uh, the OECD, what they did is they did a, t uh, they kind of tested, the, they sort of stress tested their framework. And they stress tested their framework in Israel. In particular, what they, um, uh, I don't know how many people know much about Israel, but Israel has a set of special uh, rules for people who are very religious, the ultra Orthodox Jews. Okay? Effectively, they don't have to work, they don't have to, the men don't have to do military service. Um, they, uh, anyway, they get all kinds of, it's kind of a whole set of things that, that that particular group of people get. Oh, that's right, and they also have, tend to have very large families compared to most Israelis. They live very different lives from others. Right? So they live in the same really quite small chunk of the, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, but you have these very different populations. Right? And so the, the reasonable question is, if we test with this ultra-Orthodox group and the, uh, who don't do many of the things that most Israelis do with the rest of the Israeli population, can we find much difference between the two groups? So, um, can you guess what the big difference would have been? There was one difference. 11 of them were right, but one difference was wrong. Would it be the unemployed, or not working? Yep, yeah, that's exactly it. Mm. It was the, that one. Jobs. That, that was the one, because they didn't have to get jobs. Yeah. So jobs didn't feature very prominently mm. in their thinking. Everything else was almost identical. Right? And it, when you're, I mean, as a kind of natural experiment to stress test this sort of framework, Uh, so, and, and I, my, again, my first is you think slightly facetiously, but you think of you know, human beings evolving in sort of somewhere around Ethiopia, Kenya, about 100,000 years ago, sort of thing, 150,000 years ago, before people left to go, uh, Homo sapiens took over the rest of the world, right? Things like health and the means for material well-being, and you know the, their culture 
and uh, you know, how well they got on with each other in terms of civic engagement, and whether they had shelter, and whether they felt safe, and whether they felt connected with the rest of the sort of tribe and this kind of thing. Right? There's something kind of deeply human. Forget that, you know, just something deeply human which has nothing to do with the industrial world in this set of measures. Yeah? So I, I actually don't think it's at all surprising, but it's something you have to test. Just sort of linking the two together. Okay, so if you're thinking about policy, right, this is this again goes back to my concept car idea uh, and the, the sort of three wheelers. What we're trying to do. If you're thinking about this being a day job, right, so it's all very well for me to rattle off lists of numbers. Right, most of those numbers reflect in some variant of that data already. It's not about collecting numbers. It's about changing what people do, but when you change what people do, hopefully. For Changing the day jobs of people with a very minimum extensivity. Okay? So, to give you a sense, that's a third of the economy. Okay? One dollar in every three spent in New Zealand is spent in somewhere around the five dollar extensivity. Okay? Uh, and in particular, and, and this, this goes really goes back to like the example I gave at the very beginning around sort of thinking of mental health and that sort of side of things. I think I I'm um, sorry to say this, but I think there are people working in academia who have some sense that, the New Zealand, uh, like in New Zealand Treasury or in other treasuries, we sit there and we, we tell everybody exactly how and what the best evidence is, and that's just what happens in hospitals. Okay? For the avoidance of doubt, that's not how it works. Okay? Right? You have ministries of health because you need ministries of health to manage all the different aspects of these things. Uh, and what this framework that you've just seen does allows us to link the work of people like myself in the Treasury, where we're thinking mostly about advice around funding, with the stuff that people in things like the Ministry of Health are doing when they're thinking about sector policies in those areas, to what actually happens in the health system. Right? So the education is actually a really good example of this. Uh, um, if you're aware, there's a group who look at positive education, so the psychology of education, and try to use that as a way of understanding how you can improve both student experiences and, and uh, welfare as teachers, and also improve education through that. Okay, um, Treasury is never going to be very good at understanding how we're going to operate positive education. Okay? Um, but that's that. The job of thinking about it at the level I've just described to you there, where you take all this evidence. So, for instance, the University of Melbourne, this really big group, are thinking about that. Is not the same thing as saying these national policies is not the same as what actually happens at schools. At schools, you have however many teachers has to, um, you know, has to know the individuals in the school and think about how to do the work plans for those, how to improve things, how to performance manage. That is a very different task from the task of thinking about positive education as a way forward for the system, which is a very different task from people like myself thinking about budgets and how what are the best and worst ways of spending money. I think that's damn obvious, right? You wouldn't believe that if you looked at the kind of wider literature around welfare. There's a great deal of confusion around those different elements and what you need. What the framework I've just given you does is it helps us to interact, it helps us doing this kind of high level sort of targets and budget side with people who are actually making this happen for the schools and the hope that can then help people who are actually within schools, making the system work. Okay. And it's linking those wider economic outcomes we want to do with the detail of what actually is going to happen in various jobs. Okay. So earlier you were saying how only about three billion will shift in the majority yep. is fixed. With this, are you trying to um, learn how to shift the, the bigger portion of it so that you can fit it into what we actually want to get out of it now? Exactly, exactly right. right? Um, it's less intuitive with education. Think about mental health. Right? Mental health within the health system, um, in fact, what has happened is it's really unusual in the health system. It's the only budget you get protected. So normally what you do is you give money to the DHB, and the DHB then makes some decisions. So it becomes 
conjunction with Sid Meier as well. Within, when you put mental health funding into that system, it dies. It just gets dissipated. Mm. What this is allowing us to do is to put a little bit of structure on that, saying you can do that if you, well, we don't want you to do that. If you do that, these are the bad outcomes, and we'll know about all the bad outcomes. We've got this national sort of target in this case, and I, for one, find it hard to think that we wouldn't want to improve mental health. Just sit there. Um, so what is it we can do to translate what's going on with the group of people in Wellington to make sure that happens nationally across the whole New Zealand? Yeah? That, so that's exactly right. Yeah? So the, the, the jargon we'll be using is the baselines. So it's really marginal, it's the marginal expense in the budget. It's the baselines. It's the quarter New Zealand. And if we, and if we do it properly, how that kind of shifts. Yeah? Uh, but, um, just emphasize that that's about that kind of alignment the other thing that's really hard, so mental health is another good example of this, is it's not actually just about the health system. It's also about the welfare system, it's about the education system. Um, it's horrendous thing to say, but um, a lot of people with mental health problems end up in the prison system. That thing, um, and that's a really dumb way of treating mental health. Right? Okay. Is there something we can do to not stop the system operating? And you, can do, and you can measure the economic, uh, people do measure the economic outcomes associated with that poor performance, but you can do it. It's not really the economics that we're interested in, it's the outcomes of people who are fortunately benefit. Does that make sense? Well, this is obviously. Right. Um, okay. Uh, so this is the bureaucracy bit. Right? Bureaucrats have got to do a little bit of bureaucracy. Okay. Um, the, so so I I'm from Treasury, I talk a lot about the budget, okay? I'm talking about baseline spend and that sort of thing. That's one of the instruments that go into that's how we spend that money, how we manage that money to make sure it's been spent well. Okay? Actually, government has a number of different ways of approaching uh, change. So uh, one is actually the, uh, the power of producing statistics, right? So you've seen the, the child poverty statistics legislation. Right? No magic happens. No child has a better life because a number gets published. Right? That's just not how it works. But in practice, if you make a big deal about it, <laughs> if you make a big deal about it, it can change attitudes and hopefully change some of the things that happen. So one thing is just some proper light on the numbers. Another thing is that the, um, for those of you with very civic things, you have these groups uh, called the cabinet committees. You'll hear the cabinet, the cabinet meets Monday mornings, that's when on Monday mornings you'll see the Prime Minister usually will come out and make some announcements. Okay? So a cabinet meeting for most purposes is the rubber stamp of what happens in cabinet committees. So this is no big secret, right? Okay, right, this is the cabinet committee is merely the sort of official stamp of approval mostly for what happens in the cabinet committees. And cabinet committees look at things like the bar. So the cabinet committees is where an awful lot of the substance of what happens in government goes on. And what we can do is provide measures that help in those cabinet committees um, so that when they are thinking about what good performance in education the right place and looks like, it's part of that thing. So it's not just about how we spend, it's also about thinking about the initiatives that are thoughtful in those cabinet committees. Okay, so that's one of the other places. So, so I've got here, this is a kind of various reports, we've also got the changes to the cabinet committees. We've also got the legislative changes, so you are all, of course, aware of the potential reform of the Public Finance Act. No? <laughs> Not even the economists, okay. Mm -hmm. Public Finance Act is, in as much as New Zealand has a constitution, the Public Finance Act, the State Services Act, and uh, another one that I can't remember the name of, but basically says um, you can't spend money without that. Uh, but the, um, is it against the but the yeah, it's not called macro prudential. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a macro, but it is, it's not called macro prudential. Right? It's, so um, it relates. To but it relates to macro prudentiality. That's right. Yes, macro prudential. Yes. So yes, that's right. So those three acts together are basically, the and they they the, the structure of the way government operates. Right. So when I was managing the team, I had to sign a piece of paper that said 
I am responsible for spending a particular budget. Right? That, that was part of a process that goes right through, actually it's the Governor General, right? where each dollar that gets spent, somebody is responsible for it. Right? And if you run a school, you have to sign your equivalent for that when that money gets allotted to your school. Right? That sounds really simple. It is unique to New Zealand. Okay? We know where every single dollar goes, and so not just that, we know who is responsible for it throughout the entire system. Right? Prior to the 1980s, we didn't have that in New Zealand, and we don't have that now. Okay? So that's that kind of. Um, so that's the kind of, and that changes the way the system operates. Uh, anyway, so th those are the different kinds of instruments you have there. So it's not just about budget, it's also about how we think about uh, the, the processes of government. So to remember what I said earlier about the day job, I'm trying to change the day job, the way the system is about the business system. Okay, um, so this is the bit I do know more about, because uh, I'm leaving Twitter actually in May, but uh, for the last 10 years I've been involved in, right? This sort of process. Um, so, uh, if any of you ever do public policy courses, right? One of the things I would I have said this to the kinds of public policy professors and things. I want them just to take their textbooks and rip the damn thing out, right? And the damn thing is this cycle. You hear this expression, policy cycle, right? Um, it's just not. It, the, the, what, what it, it's, I understand why they do it. They do it as a way of explaining the things, right? But it's just not how the system works. It's like, you know, like when you were. Presumably when you did physics at um, high school, you have like point masses and friction-free surfaces. So imagine that, and then try to design a car on the assumption that they're friction-free surfaces. Right? That's the equivalent of what doing with these damn diagrams. Okay? So um, this is a sort of stylized version, and I've said it very diplomatically in the way I've written it, but the process is basically in three bits. Uh, so the really intelligent bit is the first bit, right? Where ministers, and it's usually from the cabinet, um, but we explained it through our ministers, Mr. Hyman, says, tell us what we should be thinking hard about. What is it that when we look at the world is really important? The Treasury provides advice on where funding should go. So it's still the three billion, it's not 14 billion, that's a different process, but this is still that marginal spend, okay? And uh, we did, in 2019, we did a report uh, in May, Sorry, 2018, we did a report in May for this budget, right? So it's part of that. So again, I'm not telling you any big secrets. These were all announced in December, right? Okay, um, and that, that process actually takes about six months. But basically what happens is the month before the 2018 budget was announced, we started the 2019 budget for this year, okay? Right, so the budget's over there for that. That's that. I might just ask, who... Um Instigated this, uh, like, when, uh, like the living, like the well-being budget type thing. Who, who initiated it? So the, there's two different strands. So the living standards framework itself came from Treasury. It's an initiative we've been working on uh, for a while. And the bit that you see here is the version that I, I can talk from 2017. Right. Yeah, so was it accepted by government in 2017? So or? this. That's right, so this government has a particular this, focus on well-being and yeah. has used that framework. It doesn't have to be. Right. It did. Yeah. Yeah. So was the previous government supportive of this happening already? Or? So this is where I have to be very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> In fairness to the previous government, I don't think we did a particularly good job. Right? And, um, so I don't think we did a particularly good job. We presented a very bad version of this work. And oh, okay. the, because you had just started working on that policy? Yeah, this is where I'm just going to take that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we didn't do a particularly good job of it. And in fact, and so I think, and in, for me in particular, because I was working on social investment, so how do you yeah. target money to help people yeah. people in poverty? Yeah. There is no inherent um, contradiction between well-being and poverty and social investment. Oh, okay. We made a terrible job explaining that to the government. Of the social investment? Of, who were very interested. Bill English was quite keen on yep. social investment. Yep. So, because uh, there was quite, there seemed like a lot of people were against the social investment. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> but you were saying it's some. This is similar to. 
Uh, it, it's not so much, uh, they can be aligned. So social investment is about if you looked within government and you wanted to use the data, it's a very nerdy data thing. Essentially, yeah. if you want to use, what's the best way of using government data? So the example I gave you the week before we had this conversation was one of the analysis we did was we looked at children age two mm -hmm. and said, how well can we predict what government is going to spend on those children in the coming year before they're 25? Mm -hmm. right? And we were horrendously accurate and were able to predict that. And by that, to be clear, the vast majority of that spend is funding to make sure, uh, because people are long-term unemployed, prisons, prisons are damn expensive places, right? which you don't do very much. Uh, and the kind of extra bits around education so um, that's what social investment is about, mm. trying to view the new technologies around the data that the government already has right. to, to, to better use it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can use that within a well-being framework, but right. it's not the same as a well-being framework. Right. Okay. Uh, and it is horrendous. I was saying to you, it is horrendous. There's a group, there's a 1 or 2% of New Zealanders who have more than 60% chance of having some combination of uh, imprisonment and long-term unemployment and not having that you can predict at two, right? Okay. Let's off topic, right? Uh, so it's, yeah, so you've got the second bit, right, where you say, right, at, so this, we, we've said these are the things, they then come back to the details, right? And you may have heard a few weeks ago a discussion about a cost-benefit analysis and about our model of cost-benefit CVACs, which was discussed in Parliament because we used an estimate for a financial estimate for the value of having social connections. Right. Um, so, uh, so the, the economy says actually, and I hope most of you have done cost-benefit analysis of some kind in your courses. Sure. Okay. Right. You can actually provide because the point of it, what you're doing is you're saying how relative they're using this as a kind of weight. How relatively important are these things when you're making financial decisions? Right. Um, and as I said to you earlier, social connections is the equivalent of things like suicide. Right? So if you are interested, seriously interested in things like suicide, you're going to put a very high weight on social connections, which will be in the tens of thousands of dollars. I see that in the cost benefit analysis. Right? That's what we're looking for. It, it sounds weird when you have a, you know, a two line question in Parliament, but that's basically what it means. Yeah? So anyway, that's that part. Um, and then when I was starting this about policy cycles, okay, so this sounds a bit like a policy cycle. So we do these kind of two neat bits, and then you have the smoke filled rooms and dirty politics. Right? Or the nice way of saying this is you know, that you bring all the different elements together. And that, that's, we've just come out of that phase now. Okay, there's a lot of smoke filled rooms and dirty politics here too, but this is pure dirty politics. Okay? Um, yeah. So, uh, so the, the language I'm using. Sorry, go ahead. Is that the best idea? Because <laughs> it's important for people to know how the budget actually supports the objectives. That's what gets people on board, I think. I think there's a, what you've got to think of is that the, there's different elements. So the bits of information feed into what's fundamentally a social bargaining process. Right? So though uh, I'm saying this kind of facetiously, the, the point of democratic government is that you have some kind of social welfare function, right? But the problem is those elements are really badly defined until people actually go through the process of actually trying to get to the point of where they're at. So what's going on in here is the bargain that actually generates the social welfare function. Yeah? Okay. It just um, it just doesn't look very nice when you're close to it. I can say it in a nice way like that, and you have these lovely clean equations with the elements in them and the balance between them. When you're there, it's somebody rings somebody else up and they just have a chat at six o'clock over a beer, and that's how they work things out. Right? Okay, or a row, or that's, that's how it actually works. Right? 
Can, can I be, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this in a facetious way, but be aware, this is, this is what we mean by democracy, right? We take the different, we take the evidence, we assess what, what we can do on the you know, basis of the evidence, and then we bring a democratic process to say, well, what, what would we actually do about it? Well, so, you know, it's, it's messy, it's dirty, it's very human, but it is, that's, that's part of the system we're working with. Right? Um, and just to give you a sense of this side, um, the priorities, which were published in December, December 4th, no, December 11th. Um, so the five priorities for 2019 for the well-being budget are sustainability, low emissions economy, supporting digital participation, lifting more emphasis on the sphere of opportunity, reducing child poverty, and violence, and supporting the mental health of children. So that's, that's a kind of level which they have. That's that side. But then these are the just to be clear again, yeah, New Zealand, whenever they do um, like you know, these, these international groups that look at public finance, um, the rules of the way public finance works, New Zealand always comes top. Right? This is what open, transparent, messy world looks like. To this, this is me being this is a bureaucrat, so this is my organization. Just wants to be clear what's in the free license. Okay? This is the stuff we do. So, this is the stuff of uh, team I led. This is what we do. Yeah? This is what the government wants to do. So, this goes to the question. Yeah? What's the difference between those two? Um, and yeah, um, if by any chance any of you are thinking of master's theses or this is a research or whatever, um, I can say to you now, don't try to do that one. That's something which somebody who's got years of experience who wants to win a Nobel Prize will do, right? But these, the first and the third, um, most definitely aren't. So when people talk about equality, what they usually mean is income equality. Um, income inequality is not a very good proxy even for material well-being. Okay. So when we look at, um, I don't know if you know, but the child poverty measures is actually the eight of them. The reason, one of the reasons it's going to be eight of them is if you do two different kinds of measures, you say one measure is going to look at um, you know, how bad is someone's life? Do they have shoes? Does their house have a roof that fits? That's material deprivation. Another set of measures looks at income. Are you in the bottom quarter of the income distribution? Okay. The overlap to them is roughly only half. So the people in the bottom quarter, uh, half of those are not in material deprivation. Okay. And if you thought about it, it would be kind of obvious, because um, you're a really good example of people who have low income but don't actually remain in some material Um, but also pensioners. Um, quite we, the, the, one of the secrets of this data is the bottom decile of income is made up of quite a lot of wealthy people. Right? Because they are people who are running companies. They can't really do too much income from their companies. Right? Now, elderly people, their income doesn't come from income, it comes from having a lot of assets which allow them to think quite well. That sort of thing. Okay? So you have to be very careful. Uh, so that's, that's how we do the sort of measure. We start with income, and then we look at other things. But if you remember those spider diagrams I did, the ones where we didn't do that, we looked across the whole of the different dimensions of well-being and made the comparisons there. Nobody yet has formed a way of measuring equity in that multi-dimensional basis. And so you're hopefully you know what the Gini coefficient is. Hopefully you've got the income equality here. There's no Gini equivalent for there for well-being. So you can do it for like your subjective well-being, so that single measure of how happy are you today, you can do it there. But the multi-dimensional side is what you need to do. Uh, I, I mean, even if we don't do a genie, just something that helps us actually say how we are equal on multi-dimensional well-being. Um, I discovered this as I was doing the work, and it's one of those screen moments, right? And you're sort of going to try and do something with a 
presented and we suddenly realize that, oh my God, this thing which we know is really important to lots of people, it just isn't exactly responsive to us. I just would love to see some people do that work. Um, and the other, so going back to my unemployment rate example, right? In, um, or the, the, the system of national accounts, which gives you your GDP measure, huge amounts of work into that. And a lot of the, the work is very, very specialized, but no one, uh, we have, don't have equivalents for well-being. So if you, um, so the, uh, the, I haven't put graphs here, but you can compare, you think, think about, like, the, I gave the example of unemployment, where I said this really narrow measure we use of unemployment rate. It's a very powerful statistic for understanding the economic cycle. Right? Very, very powerful. It didn't, it's not some magic. A group of human beings over a period of several decades developed that. Right? Um, we don't have equivalents for well-being. Right, so that's actually that kind of work in there. And, uh, we need that if we're going to make this useful. So, um, so we have this. Right, and finally, this is a slide just talking about different sources. Um, I'll just point out to you um, the United Nations report. So it came out, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the happiness report, the global happiness report. So that's a variant of what we're looking for. They are looking mostly at that subjective well being. So how happy are we today? Uh, but this is a whole range of things, and if you're interested, I would recommend you go. I would also recommend you go to the Treasury website because we've got various pieces of fantastic work. Yeah, I hope this isn't on the website. Yeah, we'll put it on. Oh, website. is it going on the website? Um, on the, the, the Facebook YouTube post. Uh, the video um, on will the, be on YouTube. But the so. slides will be on, um, on the Facebook page. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. And email them as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so the dash, you play with the dashboard. Um, the wellbeing budget is the end of May. See a lot of this work uh, coming into that. Better Life Index has been produced every two years. Fantastic resource. It's a starting point if you're looking at that. And this is uh, just some of the research. So that, that links in lots of sustainable development goals. Okay. Um, so that this is not the same as sustainable development goals, but it's got some links to it. So thank you very much. And it is wonderful to have a small audience so we can have a chat. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Public policy, you yeah. said anyone studying it don't use the textbooks or something? <laughs> <laughs> From your I, point of view, if you were studying it, I what? Uh, it's all right, but yeah. I don't, uh, I think, uh, I have met some amazing fellow recruiters and interns from Auckland University. I'd say it's quite a lot of diversity. I think it's to do with the quality of the courses that they that they deliver. Mm. Um, so um, and it's also that's difficult between understanding a system and actually working with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what you have to do. Yeah. It's just quite interesting because last year I did an online course um, through the Institute of Global Prosperity in London. Okay. Have you heard of that? I, I've heard of it. I don't think I've actually. Oh, okay. So the course was called Beyond. GDP beyond oh, global prosperity beyond GDP. Yeah, yeah. And so, and it's an area that I'm really interested in. And there's the whole, you know, circular economy. Um, oh, like this Rowley. Kate Rowley. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don donut economics. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that whole area I find really interesting. So this work is very firmly in that. Yeah. That area. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, they're, they're all linked, but they're, this mm. is, it's. Um, one of the secrets of the, there's actually this group of statisticians from Europe who around in the 1990s got together and did most of the development work for this. They then went off to different places, so some went to the UN, some went to the OECD, some of them came back to New Zealand. Right? And um, so a lot of this is actually very similar. It's yeah. begun to move forward. Yeah. 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 It's really interesting though trying to find courses to, in like, these, that, there was that online course, which isn't a degree course, but it's to get students into their degree courses in the UK. But you know, not. here for study, it's. There are people, I mean, Jennifer Curtin, who's the. Yeah, I keep meaning to go and talk to her, but I just, it's, I have this question about the, you know, what you're going to study. And, yeah. I mean, can I, just my challenge to you this week, what is it you want to get? Because right? this is. One of those areas where there's a there's a statistical question: How well does GDP measure the quality of well-being? Right? 
um, yeah, sort of social policy, social, uh, it's impro basically improving people's lives or, you know, yeah, but I'm still, that's a question I'm still uh, um, sort of asking myself, but. I, I mean, I, I don't, prefer, I, my view is that I'm having looked at all this and spoken to some people, that there is quite a lot of, there's a lack of clarity about what people want rather than clarity. So yeah. when you've applied it through what I've worked on, mm. um, mm. by thinking hard about what it would look, what we would do differently, that's our approach. Yeah. It would be fair to say that's not a common approach. I've seen this sometimes with people with various levels, but it's not a common yeah. approach. So when you say you look at what you would do differently, yeah. What sort of places, like, where did you ask those questions, I guess? Because I'm thinking, like, the circular economy and the ideas that have come out of that. I mean, I just sort of, when I did economics, like, 30 years ago, we didn't, you sort of touched a little bit on, um, you know, environmental and... Um, so, so my question's a much lower level now. So yeah. We have a team in the Treasury, actually, a lot of teams in the Treasury, yeah. that deal with budget. Yeah. So if this is going to change... Wellbeing is going to change how government operates. Um, what is it that team does that it doesn't do before? Yeah. And what does it stop doing yeah. that it's used to do? Yeah. Well, that's what I mean by changing yeah. people's daily habits. Right. Um, yeah. And um, with the greatest respect to Gabriel, I don't think she answers that question. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it answers a much higher level question about some of the things that we'd like to have outcomes we'd like to see rather than. And if you're going to see wellbeing become the ways the way government happens, yeah. that's what happens. People's day jobs changes. Yeah. 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 No. So, yeah. That's good. Mm, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if we've got better good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one last question. Oh, yeah, yeah, we have sure, time. Sure. Um, going back to the inspire diagrams, yeah. did the government use that? Did they, did they use that to inform the decisions as you know as to their lobbying budget 2019? Or was it? So it was part of the. It, it was, was part of the information. Yeah. So we're seeing some sort of multidimensionality coming in. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Definitely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is not that's good. Right? This no, that's is good. Alice into something. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's the uh, uh, the hard thing is not the um, the multidimensionality. It's just to think about the trade-offs. Yeah. Um, prioritization is one part of the trade-offs. Mm -hmm. The other part is how do you understand what you want? Prioritize this. I was to project for I think the area of government will help um, in the moment is a really good test case because you're trying to shift what the institutions, the set of institutions are doing, and they're just not quite working for what's in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a really good test case of whether or not we can actually call what we want and what we can actually call or can do what I think what New Zealand proved the most of what we to see actually happen. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and how does the framework relate to like other measures like GDP of happiness? Is that so like, GDP of happiness? I think. Yeah, I think there's a happiness sort of um, measure. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, so when uh, people talk about happiness, they yeah. usually mean some measurement of that. Subjective. Subjective. Yeah. There's uh, if you ever get into the philosophy of these things, it becomes quite quickly apparent that so happiness is like, you know, you've had a good day, I feel happy, yeah. right? But the difference between that and something like people feeling contented, mm. the way things are, you can have unhappy days, but actually be quite contented, right? Um, and then there's also something that's much more about your kind of, on, you know, are you the kind of person you want to be, right? Um, so you can be, satisfy some of this feeling of where things are at the moment and where you might be happy, but you may have a different view of whether you're the person you want to be. There's lots of Greek words you can throw in here for those different two things, right? Uh, but um, though, when you think about what it is to feel well-being, to feel happy, to feel committed, these, there's a, so much of a mix of things going on. This is one of the reasons why I think Makes it more objective than subjective. Yeah, it, it, I mean, and you can do the regression. I mean, the if you go to the OECD website, it will show you a lot of the background work they did. I think it's included in these different measures. So I think um, it's, 
chose to do what I chose to do, right? I have the capabilities, right? I will make my own choice about how I wish to, to live within the capabilities. So Sen's view is what we're trying to do is maximize those opportunities through people's capabilities. Right? Uh, I, my, again, the, uh, so there's a lot of discussion about it. My, that works really, really well when you talk about poverty. Right? So you're talking about people in absolute poverty. Um, you're saying things like they don't have the nutrition when they're a baby, which means physically they are incapable of doing certain things when they grow up. When you talk about capabilities, you have a lack of capability. That's really, really painful. When you um, talk about you know, people who are richer, it becomes a lot harder to, to, to measure these kinds of things and to know what you mean. So, so for instance, if you know somebody who's very lazy and doesn't get as good a degree as they, as they you think they could have done, does that mean that they have done what they wanted to do? Does that mean there was some psych, some problem that should have been dealt with that allowed them to do? You know, at what point do we say they are living the life they want to live, which is lazy but with lower lower education and some consequences, or conversely that there's something wrong with they, the kind of person that ended up in that position? That's and that's across the board, right? That's not just, just education, that's across the board, you end up in that kind of thing. So I don't think, I mean, it, have you heard of mentalized hierarchy of needs? Yes. That idea, right? So at the low end, it works really, really well. As you go higher up, it becomes much harder, I think, to adjust to the hierarchy. Oh, sorry. Sorry, one question. I'm happy to sorry, take questions. Sorry, sorry, so just, just um, whole um, I might have missed this, yeah. and I'm new to the whole, um, this data analysis thing. What? From years ago, anyway. Um, this information, are you saying that you get it already from these various sources that you mentioned before, like statistics and yeah, yeah census and all those sort of things? Oh, okay. We do have, the, the, we have two problems though. One is that yeah. we, so at the time that we get it every decade, right, which right. is completely useless for policy purposes. Yeah. So they can have the information, we just take it away from Right. Uh, and the other is like, so PM is basically a measure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.